Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the second webinar of Erwin Mitchell's Let's Talk About Stroke mini series. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us and for taking the time out of your busy schedules to connect with us. I'd also like to thank our fantastic guest speakers for agreeing to take part in what we hope will be a really informative and helpful session. For those, that you, for those of you that are unable to attend the first session, my name is Jenna Harris and I'm a senior associate solicitor at Erwin Mitchell, specialising in medical negligence claims. And I'm co-hosting the event today with my colleague Gurpreet Lally, an associate solicitor from our Cambridge office. Today's webinar will focus on neuropsychology and capacity for stroke survivors. The final session of the series will take place at the same time next Thursday and will be focused on focusing on working with stroke survivors. If you haven't already signed up for that session, please feel free to do so. We've got some excellent speakers lined up for that too. Before I hand over to Gurpreet though, I just wanted to uh, run through a couple of housekeeping points. Firstly, thanks to those that have submitted questions in advance. We'll do our best to ensure that they're addressed towards the end of the session today. If you haven't already submitted a question and you'd like to do so, you can do it throughout the session using the question and answer fun function on your screen. We just ask that when you submit your questions, please include your name and your email address so that if we don't get around to it today, we can make sure that we respond to you directly after the session. We will also be recording this virtual event today and be circulating it after the event, along with the recording from our first session last week. Finally, towards the end of the session, we'll be posting a feedback link and we'd be really grateful if you could spare two minutes just to let us know your feedback um, from the series so far. Thanks again, everyone. I'll pass it over to Gurpreet. Thanks, Jenna. Um, so our first speaker today is Dr. Kashim Ford, um, who is a consultant clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist. Um, Dr. Ford assesses and provides treatment to patients with neuropsychological and psychological conditions, mainly in the areas of neurology, head injury, spinal injury, burns and trauma. Her specialist interest is acquired brain and neurological disorders. Dr. Ford also works with adults, children and their families and carers. She has worked with cases nationally and internationally in Israel, Denmark, India, Australia and the USA and she has presented papers at national and international conferences in neurosciences. Dr Ford, uh, in addition to her medical legal work, has nearly 30 years of experience working in the NHS. The current interest is advising and assisting the NHS commissioning groups in delivering neuropsychological treatment services uh, to neurologically impaired patients and their families and carers using digital technology both in clinical and via remote video. I'll hand over to Dr Ford now. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Oh. Yes. Yeah. Right, so um, I'm going to be talking about the effects of stroke on neuropsychological functioning and how that in turn impacts on important areas of an individual's life. I'm not going to talk a great deal about stroke itself. I'd defer to a neurologist or a consultant in rehabilitation to provide details of medical, physical and the epidemiological aspects of stroke. Um, may I have the next slide please? The, the important issue to stress is that it's a frequent cause of disability in adults in UK and I, there are over one and a half million strokes survivors with considerable disabilities. The disabilities are complex, uh, interrelated, and the approach for stroke and most neurological uh, pathologies is a multi-therapy, multidisciplinary approach. So although I'm going to be discussing neuropsychology, I will be bringing in other therapists. Um, may I have the next slide, please? Um, I, I like to have diagrams to try to simplify complicated issues. And in, in this slide, I, I just want you to sort of grasp the complexity that a, a brain pathology can have. It, something like a stroke, impacts physical cognitive, psychological, emotional and behavioural issues. And it's important to address the physical issues because they do contribute to 
cognitive and psychological factors and there's a real overlap and um, interplay. If I could just discuss the, the physical aspects which are on the right hand side of the screen, um, issues like hemiplegia, although I'll just defer to physiotherapists and speech and language experts to describe this in detail, but very briefly, you know, something like hemiplegia, which is a paralysis of the side of the body, you get uh, sensory loss, you get neglect, you get spasticity, spasticity can result in pain, and pain and pain related factors impact your cognition, your mood, and then the individual can become entrenched in what we call a vicious negative cycle. There's the issue of mental fatigue, physical fatigue, all of that then feeds into this individual's thinking processes. We've got factors such as um, aphasia, which is a loss of, of, of full language, dysphasia, you, loss of parcel language, you have a, ataxia or apraxia, where the ability to carry out skilled physical activities like making a cup of tea or getting dressed, these are affected. If, if I can then move you over to the left side of the screen, cognitive aspects. Cognitive aspects are, cognition is just your thinking skills. So concentration, memory, perception, communication. Although I, I am going to say stroke, Communication difficulties are very much an issue for speech and language therapists and we desperately need to liaise with them. But from a neuropsychological perspective, it's the attention and executive issues that are crucial. And towards the end of my talk, I'm going to discuss the executive issues in a bit more detail. But I just want you to get a flavour of the issues that a survivor of strokes having to deal with. And then if you look at the middle section, you've, you've got the what we call the psychological affect issues, depression, anger, poor confidence, motivation. Now, all of these factors will impact an individual in personal care, day to day life, occupation, social life, leisure, driving, simple things like remembering to take the medication, so that the functional consequences can be significant. Um, I also want to say that there's the implications of cognitive psychological issues on decision making capacity. And I know Hugh's going to be discussing capacity in, in, in a lot more detail, but there are really some strong parallels between the neuropsychological impairments and deficits following stroke and the test of capacity and the criteria that are being tested in the different arms of the mental capacity test. But I'd like to talk a little bit more about the cognitive and psychological impact of stroke and then I'm going to move on to the role of a neuropsychologist in assessing these deficits and how they help inform lawyers the, the medical legal context of capacity but also the the, the treating team the the therapist the physio the speech and language therapist so it's about setting up a support package and a therapy package for the um, individual but also to stress that stroke does not occur in isolation it occurs within a social family context it occurs within the context of the individual's pre-stroke coping styles and abilities. So you're dealing with complicated, complex factors that are all interacting with each other. And it doesn't take much for one issue to completely compound the others. And, and for me, I would say pain and fatigue are the major factors that can really cause problems to become exacerbated. May I have the next slide, please? I just want to talk a little bit about the cognitive, behavioural, emotional issues that can occur after a stroke. Cognitive changes are the most common throughout 
80% of stroke patients have cognitive problems. That's issues with memory, concentration, and um, how quickly or slowly the brain is processing information. Um, it needs to be stressed that different types of strokes and different severities of strokes have, have different implications for the kinds of cognitive problems the patient will have. So if you've got a stroke towards the right side of the brain, that's likely to affect sort of nonverbal issues. Not always, but generally. If it's the left side, then it's the verbal aspect. But moving down to the slide, the executive functioning. Um, in the old days, this was termed frontal lobe functioning. The frontal lobes are a large part of the human brain, a third of the brain, and they're responsible for the high level um, cognitive tasks of planning, organizing, judgment, um, and sort of having awareness. And I will discuss this in a bit more detail later on because it, it, it has implications for capacity. But the neuropsychology field has moved away from frontal lobe. We now call it executive functioning because it isn't just the frontal lobe that's involved. There are other parts of the brain and the frontal lobe connects to other important parts of the brain in order to have executive functioning. So we call it executive functioning. And deficits in this area are termed um, executive dysfunction or deficits in executive functioning. This is a crucial part of cognitive functioning because even if you have memory impairment, there can be ways of working around this by aid memoirs. Concentration, you can work in small chunks. If you have difficulties with speed of, of information processing, you can be taught pacing. But executive dysfunctions can lead to such severe issues, particularly of impulsivity, lack of insight, lack of awareness, and the individual has problems, such problems that they're not aware of, that they could present in a misleading manner. And again, for capacity, this has important implications. But I'll just move on to other issues. Visual spatial, visual perceptual issues also occur. Some of the cognitive deficits can be really obvious, like aphasia, your communication difficulties, neglect, where they neglect one side of the body, or they can be very subtle. So they can be intellectual difficulties, but the individual performs in a way that they're competent, they're discussing things, they're carrying them out, and you wouldn't realise that there are difficulties, particularly with executive issues. Um, may I have the next slide, please? The next slide discusses emotional impact of stroke and you'll see there's depression, 30% of stroke patients present with that, anxiety, 30% of patients present with this, and then emotional ability. Now emotional ability can occur, emotional ability means where an individual can't control their emotions. One moment they're happy, next moment they're angry, they're aggressive, or they're crying. This can be either a secondary reaction to the stroke's physical problems, pain, restrictions, and cognitive difficulties, or it could actually be a the part of the brain that controls emotions and that's been damaged. So emotional issues can be secondary, they can be reactions to the stroke and its consequences, or they can actually be due to damage the brain itself. Emotional issues are important because a lot of the time in um, our neuro rehabilitation units, focus is very much initially on physical issues because they're concrete. The physiotherapist is involved, speech and language therapies, the medical team, the nursing team, and the neuro team may be involved with the cognitive element. And often a lot of patients will say to me, you know, no one's really looking about my mood and how I'm feeling. And this is something that the NHS are beginning to become more aware of. And we're, we are mindful of this. And the reason is because mood affects compliance with medication, compliance with the rehabilitation, um, 
sometimes patients can get so low, there's suicidal issues occur, and there's also an increased burden family and the carers. So emotional psychological factors are important to be focusing in as part of the rehabilitation. It also has important implications for capacity and again I'll, I'll discuss that as I come to it. Can I have the next slide please? Behavioural changes and personality changes also are common after a stroke. Um, some of these, again, like emotional issues, are either secondary reactive issues or they're due to the actual damage to sites of the brain that are responsible for behaviour. So often stroke patients can be aggressive. That could be part of the depression or anxiety. There's also disinhibition. That is just saying the first thing comes into your mind, which is inappropriate um, and embarrassing. Um, impulsivity, that's just not thinking, just doing things quickly, rashly, um, for example, going on the internet and, and buying 10 items of clothing that you've already got and just not realising that you're spending too much money and not having an idea of the consequences of that behaviour. Uh, distractibility, patient, individuals can become easily distracted, but again, some of these can be due to actual damage to the brain and some of these are secondary reactive issues. May I have the next slide, please? I want to talk just briefly about recovery and outcome. Every individual varies. There are loads of factors that contribute to recovery. You know, uh, comorbidities, the individual's pre-stroke lifestyle, um, the social situation, their coping strategies, their social context, but generally 10% of stroke survivors make a complete recovery. 25% um, make a recovery with minor issues, but a good 40% have moderate to severe long-term issues that will impact them insofar as they'll need a support package, a care package, specialist care if they're in the home, if they're at home in the community there's a lot of stress on the family and it's important that they have support the 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 the, the site of the stroke and how severe also impacts outcome so for example some research has shown that if a stroke to the right hemisphere, right side of the brain, or when in individuals had lots of focal lesions, have more of a negative outcome. Whereas if you have a stroke affecting the left hemisphere and there's just one single lesion, the outcome is usually not as bad. But again, there are so many variables with recovery that it's difficult. You just can't say that there's, there's, there's one sort of predictive factor. Can I have the next slide? And I think the next slide just um, in a, a visual form will explain, will just sort of clarify that the road to recovery can either be very straightforward uh, or it can be full of ups and downs or it can be so convoluted, so difficult, you just don't know where the individual is going to end up. But it's important that there is a, a sort of a multi-therapy disciplinary approach to the stroke treatment and their support. Um, I'd now like to move on to neuropsychology specifically. May I have the next slide please? Um, neuropsychology very briefly, it's a, it's, it's a branch of psychology. It's the branch that specialises in the relationship between the brain and behaviour. So neuropsychologists uh, undertake specialist assessments of individuals who have a brain injury or neurocognitive difficulties. And we administer psychometric tests, questionnaires, interview carers, family, uh, employers, just to get a, a flavour of what, what the person's function is like, as well as our standardised tests. And towards the end of my talk, I'm going to be discussing not just the, the, the the aims of neuropsychology assessment, but some of the problems of a neuropsychology assessment. 
and how it, it can really help the legal, medical legal setting and social setting for assessing capacity, but it also has some difficulties. But going back to neuropsychology assessment, um, th there are structured questionnaires and specifically standardised tests that will assess different aspects of cognitive functioning. Um, and the profile of results can then indicate a specific localised damage or there's more generalised damage. Repeat testing can also provide indication of recovery or a deterioration. So neuropsychology test results in conjunction with speech and language therapy, MRI, CT scans, physiotherapy, um, observations by nursing staff and family can help establish you know, the extent of a brain injury and the impact it has on cognitive functioning and, and the deficits. Um, may I have the next slide, please? So I, I just want to give a brief run through of the areas that a neuropsychologist will normally cover and assess in a stroke patient and any patient or individual that's had a, 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 a pathology to the brain. So the starting point is always to try to estimate the pre-stroke, pre-trauma level of functioning. And because you need a baseline, you need to know what the individual is like so that you've got an idea of the extent to which there's a disparity between current observed and reported difficulties. And usually the way is to administer a, a reading test the problem with stroke is that a, a number of them have communication difficulties. Uh, they'll struggle to, to pronounce words properly. They'll struggle to read. There is dysarthria, where there's difficulty in controlling the muscles that, that are needed for speech. So often I and a lot of neuropsychologists struggle to administer a reading test. So what we do is we try to um, interview carers, family or a history of educational attainment, employment. Um, sometimes some individuals haven't had um, a great deal of ed educational attainment and that doesn't mean they weren't capable before. So you need all sorts of information. Once you've got an idea of an estimate of their pre-stroke functioning, that gives you a really good baseline to, to compare current functioning. The next stage of a neuropsychological assessment is general intellectual functioning, your IQ. Um, the IQ is subdivided into many subtests and categories. There's verbal reasoning and non-verbal reasoning. Again, different parts of the brain are responsible of these specific um, skills. We also assess working memory. Working memory is your short-term memory. It's not long-term memory, that's different. And we also assess how quick or how slow the individual is processing information, because if it's taking a very long time for the brain to process something, the patient becomes cognitively fatigued, they become overwhelmed, and then they just can't function. The next aspect of uh, an assessment for a neuropsychologist is memory. And this too is subdivided into verbal and nonverbal memory. There's an immediate memory you assess and delayed memory. Some individuals are very good at remembering information that you've just given them. But after 20 minutes, after half an hour, they can't remember what you've told them. So that's commonly seen in um, stroke patients. Then another and most important area is your executive skills, the sort of the frontal lobe area. And this is divided into cognitive, such as planning, problem solving, judgment, um, being able to ment mentally be flexible, multitasking. There's also a emotional aspect of that, and that's your disinhibition, perseveration. Perseveration means you just get stuck on one thing. You keep repeating it again and again, and, and you just can't budge. Um, apathy. There's this inability to motivate yourself, and we see a lot of that in stroke individuals. Um, and relatives will say, you know, what's wrong with him? Why is he being so lazy? They're not. The, the part of the brain that the get up and go 
is affected. It's like a switch that's just not working. There's also the behavioural aspect, becoming angry too quickly, the uh, volatility, uh, tearfulness, aggression. So executive skills comprise of cognition, behaviour and emotional. The impulsiveness, disinhibition also comes into this uh, constellation of symptoms. All of these information test data are crucial, but you also need to know how is that individual functioning in everyday life? You know, such as can they get themselves dressed? That requires a lot of planning, organising, structure, doing things in order, cooking, shopping. Can they organise their paperwork? Remember to take their medication. How aware are they of their problems? You know, are they denying their problems and not monitoring themselves and they have poor insight? Because if this is an issue, then you've got safety and risk assessment. It comes into question. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the the problems of testing. Um, I don't, it, I think, could you go back to one slide? I think we might have missed one slide. Yep. Okay. Is there a test, another slide after that? Is there one after that? Can I have a look? Right, that's the one. Yeah. Okay, I want to now um, move on to capacity because as you can see, these areas that are being assessed um, by the neuropsychologist in cognition and also in psychology, sort of psychological function, we also assess depression, anxiety, all these give really important information for capacity. But the problem is that, I mean, I, I'm going to very briefly just to summarise what my understanding of neuropsychology about mental capacity is, and Hugh will no doubt discuss it in detail, but the, the, the two-stage test of capacity, the, the first arm, the diagnostic arm that determines if there's an impairment of, of the brain or the mind, that a neuropsychologist can answer reasonably confidently, although I do need to stress that psychiatrists have a different threshold and sometimes we get into uh, some difficulties that psychiatrists have a different level of, of, of stating if the patient meets this criteria or not, whereas neuropsychologist threshold is different. But my main concern is the second limb, the, of the functional arm of determining whether the individual has the capacity to make a particular decision and it, 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 it's not just the first criteria of the um, comprehension. A neuropsychologist can answer that one as well as speech and language therapist. The second criteria of being able to retain information, our memory tests can help answer that one. But it's the, it's the third one about the ability to evaluate information, weigh pros and cons, to, to arrive at a decision. And that's where, in the last few years, neuropsychologists have really struggled, especially on the borderline cases. But I'll come back to that in a moment. I, I, I want to go back to stressing that cognitive testing usually is a good prediction of capacity rather than psychological factors. But I wouldn't underestimate psychological factors because if a patient or individual is really depressed or they're in a lot of pain and they're just not focused because they're on so much pain medication, that can affect cognition. But you've got to be mindful that testing, test results on their own may not be reliable because of, because of a number of factors. And for the legal context, practice effects is crucial. Certain test items cannot be administered within a six month period. Otherwise, the patient, the individual might perform really well and what you're getting is a practice effect. You're not actually getting recovery. In a clinical setting, you, you, you may not need to wait six months. It depends on the clinical team and the question that they want to ask. But in a legal context, you have to watch out for practice effect. Um, another issue is uh, effort 
engagement, a number of stroke survivors may have difficulties or may not have difficulties, but we can't really tell because of problems with engagement. They, they may be so tired, so fatigued, or they're in such pain and strong pain relieving medication that can just dumb down their cognitive processes. So that may affect your assessment of cognition and in turn commenting on capacity. I found that in my clinical experience, it's important to look at issues of culture and linguistic backgrounds. There are certain cultures where I've been assessing an individual and they, they are reluctant to, to tell me one way or the other because they're too frightened because it's always been the case that their husbands, their son or the, their father, the males have always made the decisions for them. So, you know, it's mindful of, of these issues. Um, the, the whole idea of reliability um, of an assessment, uh, you know, it, it, is there too much noise in the background? Is this, have you caught them on a good day or a bad day? Um, discuss your findings with the relatives and try to see if there is a consistency in your impression of what is the tests are saying with what is being said by those who know the individual really well. I, I want to move on to what's called the frontal lobe paradox. I know earlier on I said that um, we call it the executive dysfunction, but it's the frontal lobe paradox is where individuals can come across really well, much better than they actually are. So especially those who've got really good language skills, they can they can come across unimpaired and those assessing the individual will think they're fine, but in day to day life, they're really struggling. And sometimes the frontal lobe, frontal lobe paradox patients um, may, may come across well in a test situation. And don't forget, neuropsychologists undertake standardized tests in a quiet, distraction free consulting room, usually over a number of sessions. So you've got the best optimal uh, environment. Real life isn't like that when there are so many challenges made on the individual. So the frontal lobe paradox could, is they, an individual performs really well in a test situation, but not in real life or they may come across really well in a one-to-one -one conversation, um, but not in real life. And the important issue here is what we call the, the disconnect syndrome, where the, the individual can say the right things and they can tell you, for example, how to make a cup of tea, how to make a cheese on toast. But when you put them in the kitchen, they don't know how to do it. There's a disconnect between the knowing and the doing. And when you translate that into capacity of the functional arm of determining whether the individual has capacity, you can imagine how, how much difficulty neuropsychologists have because you can say to the judge, well, my assessment shows that they in a testing situation, they can make decisions, they can say the right things, they can evaluate, but in real life situations, they haven't got insight and they can't. So th th this is a really important issue. And I think social workers, occupational therapists need to be really aware of this frontal lobe paradox, um, as, as well as the, you know, my, my colleagues in the, in the legal field. Um, I, I think it's important because if we don't get this right, uh, we may have individuals as classes having capacity when they don't, or it could be the other way, and that has imp impact on how safe they are in day-to-day -day life. And actually, it's also how vulnerable they are as well. I want to end quickly on uh, remote assessments. Um, due to the COVID pandemic, there's been a lot of pressure on, on, the, on us in the NHS to try to um, assess uh, stroke and brain injury patients remotely. For psychological issues, I have no problems and my colleagues have no problems. But when it comes to cognitive assessments, um, we struggle. And especially for medical legal purposes, because cognitive tests have to be administered in clinical, sterile 
equivalent conditions. You have to make sure there's no no way of someone cheating. There's there's nobody behind the pay individual showing them the answers. So remote assessment of cognition isn't working. It's not reliable. Even though I know who you're going to discuss that the courts are allowing capacity to be assessed remotely, but the neuropsychology world is struggling from the cognitive aspect. Uh, it has to be done face to face just to make sure you're actually picking up everything correctly. Um, so I, I, how am I doing GURPS for time? Am I all right? Yes, no, you're fine. Yeah, can I go for a bit more or? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know what the the answer is for the the difficulties with the remote assessment, um, but I, all I'll say is I think we just have to have them face to face. The the the, the, the other issue is I, I think neuropsychology as clinicians we need to be um, informing the legals professionals about our concerns and how can this be translated into the mental capacity act to so sort of sort of flag it up so that the legal definition and the clinical definition really need to um, sort of marry and not be in conflict and make it easier for you in the legal world um, I'm, I'm hoping that that'll be up, up for discussion um, other issues are how do you assess somebody who's got really severe stroke physical issues such as uh, you know, really severe aphasia? They, they can't speak, they can't read, their comprehension is affected. Um, how do you assess somebody who's got really severe visual issues? Um, so there are challenges, but that's where you need the team. That's when you look at, we've got a list of their, 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 their impairments where are their strengths, what is intact, um, if there's poor communication in, in verbal forms, do we have non-verbal intact, is there a visual component, we can perhaps use that to help get around capacity issues. Um, so, 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 so that's a factor, but please, please, please always, always be mindful of physical issues of pain, the effects of pain medication, and that can create a patient's uh, cognitive functioning fluctuating. So they're already in a really, really uh, poor level of functioning and you add on these issues uh, and, and, and then it, it becomes a, a, a really a, a poor level of functioning in day-to-day -day life and, and in testing. So I, I think that's all I've got to say. Um, Thank you. Time. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you, uh, Dr. Um, if anyone's got any questions for Dr. Ford, please do pop them on in the Q and A on the side, and we'll come back to them at the end. Um, our next speaker is uh, Hugh Butler, who is a solicitor in our Public Law and Human Rights team in Cambridge. Um, he's been with the team since 2015, and his work primarily focuses on community and care matters, including judicial review challenges, court of protection, welfare, and serious medical treatment disputes. And um, over to you, Hugh. Thank you very much, Gertrude. So, um, yes, I'm going to talk about the Mental Capacity Act, which, as many of you will know, defines capacity in law uh, and provides a framework for making uh, best interest decisions. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So I'm going to cover the key principles here, the basics of how uh, decisions should be made lawfully on someone else's behalf and the Dole's procedure and how that fits in with um, the, the wider picture of best interest and disputes under the Act. Um, it's actually very helpful to hear what Dr Ford has said in relation to the clinical side of capacity assessments as well. And I think there'll be some points that can uh, fit in with hers quite nicely. Um, so if we move to the next slide. These are the principles which apply whenever we're ma making any or taking any action under the Act. So I won't go through all of them, but I would pick out the middle one. I think an unwise decision on its own is not enough to say that someone lacks capacity is a very important you know, factor. Uh, so in other words, we're looking at the way that the person is making the decision rather than the decision itself. So of course, people make unwise decisions. We all do it all the time, but that on its own won't be enough. Um, we also need to start the process assuming that the person has capacity. So the burden is on the person assessing to establish on balance of probabilities that this person lacks capacity. Can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> 
So before we do the capacity assessment, we've got to consider a few things. Um, I would say the two most important things are defining the decision and who the decision maker actually is. Um, so you might hear it said at times that someone lacks capacity in general terms, which in, in law is, is meaningless. So we need to know what they lack capacity to do. So for example, if we're talking about medical treatment, the decision is whether they have capacity to consent to that treatment. So that's, that's a very important thing and I'll come back to that. Um, the Mental Capacity Act doesn't define the decision maker, although typically this will be the person who's making the decision for P, which is the person that we're assessing. Um, that might be a social worker, it might be an advocate or a carer, etc. But in a court setting, that'll be a judge as well. Uh, and lastly, I'd say that the assessment is being done at the time the decision is being made. So the MCA Code of Practice is very clear on that. But as Dr Ford has said, that does present some difficulties when it comes to people who present particularly well in a, in a sterile setting. So I'll come back to that one as well. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So this is just a way of illustrating that if we have concerns about someone's capacity, we need to assess it. Um, it's a rather obvious point, but if they lack capacity, then we need to make a best interest decision. And in all other scenarios, we need to let them make the decision themselves because they will either have, well, they'll have capacity and they'll have been assessed as such. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So this is what Dr Ford was talking about in terms of the, the actual test. So when we're talking about assessing someone's capacity, we're talking about uh, the diagnostic and functional tests in section two and section three. Um, as Dr Ford said, an impairment is potentially subjective. Um, it's very wide as far as the law is concerned. It could be an illness, it could be a long or short term condition, something temporary like confusion or the effect of uh, drugs and alcohol. Um, this is often part of the test which is delegated to someone else like Dr Ford, um, but it's important to remember that it's the decision maker who's deciding whether someone has capacity or not. It's not, you don't want to delegate the whole decision to someone else, even though it might seem like that sometimes. Um, the presence of an impairment in and of itself isn't enough, so it needs to render the person unable to make the decision for the purpose of section three. So there's a causative link between section two and section three. Um, section three itself refers to understanding, retaining and weighing relevant information. So again, we're thinking about the particular decision that we're assessing and what the information is that's relevant to that decision. Again, if it's medical treatment, we might want to think about the risks associated with that treatment, the benefit of having it done, the potential side effects, things like that. If it was um, use of the internet, for example, we'd be focused on risks from bad actors, risk of losing money, gambling, all sorts of things. So the relevant information is really crucial and uh, defines the rest of the test. Um, I'm just going to go through these individual parts of the functional test um, as quickly as I can, but I think it's important just to and have some detail really about exactly what we mean. So understanding the relevant information is about understanding the salient factors. We don't need to have a complete understanding or the person being assessed doesn't need to have a complete understanding of what's being explained to them. Um, we can help them out. We can give P the options, differences between them and give them an opportunity to show that they understand it. Now you could evidence that in your assessment by asking them to repeat something back to you and seeing how accurate it is and writing that down. Um, section 3.4 of the Mental Capacity Act also makes it clear that the reasonably uh, foreseeable consequences of making a decision or not are also something that uh, P needs to understand. Looking at 3B, retention, retaining for a short period of time is fine so long as they can retain it for the duration of the assessment, that is, that's sufficient, they don't need to have um, a long term memory necessarily, short term can be sufficient. Um, 3C, uh, Dr Ford spoke about this and she's absolutely right that this is the problematic area. So again, we're talking about using and weighing salient factors, not every single factor. And it's very important here that we're not conflating the way that someone applies their own values with an inability to do so, to, to, to retain and um, to weigh up that information. So you see a lot of capacity assessments where it might be said that P is not attaching enough weight to a particular risk. So for not receiving care, for example. Now that's not enough, we need to show an inability to use and weigh. So remember judges are content for people to take risks as long as they're able to weigh up the consequences of those risks. So a really good way of making sure you're doing this is to 
see if P can explain the positives, negatives, risks and benefits of making a decision. And again, writing that down in the assessment. Lastly, communicating is a limb which applies in reality to very few people, certainly that we work with, because it presupposes that the person is able to understand, retain and weigh, but that not, they're not able to communicate the decision. So as Dr Ford said, I mean, there, there'll be a lot of people you're supporting with conditions like aphasia, um, which will obviously have huge implications for someone's ability to communicate. And again, we don't want to be applying too high a standard here. This is not an ability to have a long, detailed conversation. This is about P's ability to make themselves understood. So we need to be thinking proactively about how best to support them. Do they need a speech and language therapist, a close family member, someone who can interpret gesture and eye movement, things like that. So the, the onus is on the decision maker to demonstrate that they've given sufficient thought to this and to record in the assessment if they haven't provided that support, why not? And if they have, um, to, to say that. So the capacity assessment in general terms is a, is a real conversation between two people, but you need to be having it with P on their own terms and applying their own values. And the last thing I'd say on this slide is it's important to remember that the more serious the issue we're talking about, the more important it is that the risks are explained to P. There are the reasons why we consider that they are willing and able to take that action are recorded in the assessment. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So this isn't an exhaustive list, but there's just some good practice points here. But essentially an assessment which shows P's responses to open questions, has quotes from them and applies the test in section three will be a good assessment. Um, this is an ideal list, so it won't always be practical to do all of this. Um, but if the decision may result in taking uh, someone taking a huge risk and it's it's very urgent, someone maybe is about to leave hospital and potentially run into the road or something very serious like that, you, you won't have time to do all of this. So it, it's about um, following the procedure as best we can and showing the circumstances in the assessment. So if we move on to the next slide, um, I thought it would be helpful just to look at three examples of challenges with capacity assessments, which have been um, referred to by Dr Ford as well. And the first of these is remote assessments. So um, Dr Ford made some very helpful observations about this from a clinical side and um, from the law's perspective, um, remote assessments are fine. Obviously, they're becoming more common because of uh, coronavirus and lockdown. Um, but I would say that particularly in light of what Dr Ford has said, that there is, there is a much higher burden in terms of demonstrating that you've given P sufficient support to perform at their best. Um, but certainly the courts endorse this approach and some people might actually prefer them. Um, but again, even if the clinician is being asked to complete the complacency assessment, um, it's unlikely and um, ultimately it's for the decision maker to, to make the decision about whether that's enough evidence that someone lacks capacity. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So fluctuating capacity is something that um, I get asked about a lot. I mean, in reality, it's very difficult and it really will depend on the circumstances as to how best to approach it. And um, the law generally suggests that if you have uh, that you either have capacity or, or you don't have capacity. Um, we've also said that capacity is time specific, so it leaves us in a very difficult situation in terms of uh, deciding a plan for how best interest decisions and capacity assessments are going to be made. Uh, the starting point is to distinguish, is this a one-off decision or is this a repeated decision? Because if, it, if it's a one-off decision, the law would uh, suggest that you should uh, wait until P has capacity. If it's a repeated decision and we think that P's capacity is fluctuating predictably, we need to think about can we build that into their care plan and enable them to make decisions at certain times or in certain conditions when we know they will be able to make them. If not, and this is the most common example where fluctuation is unpredictable and P in reality doesn't have capacity for very long or it's in sort of fleeting moments, it might be appropriate to proceed on the basis that they lack capacity and again, that is that that is an approach that the court has taken on some occasions, like in the Greenwich case. Um, but again, I say the onus is on the decision maker to make sure that they're keeping that under review um, and ensuring that we're not making decisions you know, on behalf of someone who in fact has capacity, because that would be very serious. So there are 
ways of dealing with this. And I say it's important to be flexible and try and look at these particular situations, but there is a, a last resort ultimately where um, we can take a, a broader view and say that P lacks capacity on that basis. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, so I think this is what Dr. Ford describes as the frontal lobe paradox. Um, the, the courts are aware of situations where a person can pass a capacity test uh, during a conversation in a controlled environment, um, but you may still have concerns that they're vulnerable or that they don't actually have capacity when they're making the decision itself. Um, and I say the, the key question is, is on the slide, is there a mismatch between P's ability to use and weigh relevant information in the abstract and at the time of making the decision itself? Um, if there if there is, and if that's repeated, then if as long as we can evidence that, you could conclude that that's sufficient to show that someone lacks capacity. But as I keep saying, it's important that we keep bringing that evidence back to the functional test in section three. So this would be an unusual example where more weight would almost be being applied to the supporting evidence of someone's capacity rather than the formal capacity assessment itself and discussion with P. So it's very important that we're not uh, forgetting section three. The test is very important. So I haven't put this on the slide because it's not quite relevant to the heading, but in some circumstances, the High Court can make decisions on behalf of people who have capacity, but who require protection for other reasons. So, for example, if they're, if they're experiencing a strong and adverse influence from someone else, uh, the High Court can make a decision on their behalf, even if they've been assessed as having capacity, and that's known as the inherent jurisdiction of the High Court. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So this is this is quite self-explanatory. These are essentially best practice points. Um, I would say that the last point is slightly more of a best interest point, but it's very important, and I'll come on to those now. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So once we've concluded that someone lacks capacity, we then have to make a best interest decision. And again, just reminding you of the, the sorts of decisions and areas that we might be needing to make decisions in. Um, we also need to make sure that every decision with every different decision rather that we're taking, we've done a separate capacity assessment for it, because as we've discussed, um, each area and domain of capacity has very different uh, relevant information and will require a separate assessment. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So uh, best interests isn't defined in the law. Um, I think that's deliberate um, because it's a process, uh, but there are a list of considerations at section four, which are illustrated on the slide there. Um, it's still critical that we take P's wishes into account. So just because we've decided they lack capacity, that's, that's obviously not an off switch for their views and, and rights. But equally, on the other hand, and slightly confusingly, we're not making a substituted judgment. So we're not just deciding what P would have done if they had capacity. Best interest is, is wider than that. So it includes all of the factors on that slide. But I would say if, if P is able to uh, communicate their views and they're very clear about that, and we have a clear record of past wishes and feelings, that would carry substantial weight. And I would say particularly in medical treatment decisions. Uh, we shouldn't be making any assumptions while, whilst um, applying this process based on someone's age or condition. So whether we think someone of a certain age might not be or would be willing to take certain risks, um, we don't really want to be making any assumptions at all. Um, it needs to be entirely non-judgmental. So really we're looking at all of the circumstances from a variety of sources uh, and trying to avoid projecting our own values onto the person uh, for whom we're making this decision. So if we move on to the next slide, that, that deals with best interest decisions in a very quick way. Um, but I wanted to talk about deprivation of liberty because as uh, most of you will know, this is a very significant issue under the Act um, and there's a lot of law around this. Um, but I thought I'd go back to some first principles so people are aware of, of where this started. So we're talking here still about a best interest decision, but one which would in effect deprive someone of their liberty. So the most common example might be, might be criminal justice system being put in prison, uh, but obviously in a care context, we're talking about uh, managing risk. So this started with the Supreme Court case of uh, Cheshire West and Chester Council, um, 
what Cheshire West did is define when someone is being deprived of their Article 5 rights of liberty. Um, so we all start with our, our Article 5 rights of liberty. Everyone has that under the European Convention of Human Rights. And if that's going to be interfered with, then it needs to be proportionate and justified. So Cheshire West said someone is deprived of their liberty, uh, their Article 5 rights of liberty, if they are under continuous supervision and control and if they're not free to leave their placement. Now, that's been further defined by uh, uh, the courts as restrictions on movement, so the front door being locked, for example, treatment provided against someone's wishes, intrusions on privacy, um, and inability to leave a, a placement independently, for example. So comprehensive care packages quite often entail a deprivation of someone's liberty. So once we've decided that someone is deprived of their liberty, um, if we can move on to the next slide, what do what do we do? So it needs to be authorised. So without authorisation of the deprivation of liberty, it would be unlawful and a person could potentially bring a claim against the local authority or CCG or whoever it is uh, and receive compensation. So there are two ways of authorising a deprivation of liberty. There's the standard authorisation, which is a streamlined paper process completed by a local authority. Um, they are only available if P is in a care home or hospital. So if it's anything else, it needs to go to the court of protection. But standard authorizations are done routinely and uh, there are there are um, procedures in place that mean that those are done uh, very efficiently and quickly um, and it doesn't really require an awful lot of um, input from uh, anyone other than the decision maker in that context, which is the local authority DOLS team. I mean, although I would say obviously they should be consulting others. Um, if it's not a care home or hospital, if it's a, a community package of care, then authority from the Court of Protection is required. Um, those can be submitted to court, a paper application, and can be dealt with by the court without a hearing, but it's really up to the court to decide on that. Um, whichever option is relevant, the maximum period that anyone can be deprived of their liberty is for a year um, before the process has to be completed again. If there's a change in circumstances in the meantime, it may be appropriate to repeat the process or to remove the restrictions entirely. So it's, it's always on the decision maker to make sure they're keeping that under review, regardless of the year period. So it might be more appropriate if you feel someone's um, condition might be borderline to put a short authorisation in um, or seek two to three months, say, and have it reviewed then. So it's important that when we're talking about someone's human rights being engaged, we're really saying that a public body is interfering with an individual's fundamental freedom. So as such, a care package which deprives someone of their liberty, in fact, i.e. they're not free to leave and they're under control, um, is only going to engage someone's human rights if the care package is in some way the responsibility of the state, um, usually by the local authority or the CCG. Um, but it is worth noting that this has been construed quite broadly um, and now includes privately funded care packages in the community um, following the SRK case in 2016. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So if there's a major disagreement um, and a significant decision needs to be made, anyone can apply to the Court of Protection. Um, but it's important to remember that the Court of Protection's jurisdiction only extends to deciding whether someone lacks capacity. And if they do, what is in their best interest? So the Court of Protection has no jurisdiction to make decisions for people who have capacity. And if we move on to the next slide, um, Ordinarily, if you're going to apply to the Court of Protection, you need permission to apply to the courts and a hearing will in effect be granted by a judge and listed in the future. The one exception is that if P is under a standard authorisation, the paper process, and wishes to object at court, they can access the court for free and without permission. So they can get legal aid, they don't need to pay um, any fees or for their legal representation, um, and a judge will consider their case based on the evidence available. So we act in all sorts of cases in the Court of Protection concerning welfare, serious medical treatment, um, cases in the inherent jurisdiction of the High Court where relevant. Um, but we also advise more widely on issues of community care policy and, and, and care planning. Um, so I think the, the Court of Protection, the, the one thing I say is it is quite a um, friendly jurisdiction. It is one that um, has a lot of litigants in person, so people who don't have solicitors, and the uh, judges are, are, a lot of them are family judges, so it is quite good jurisdiction for families, and um, if they don't want to pay for legal representation or can't, 
and they can get legal aid in some circumstances and the judges will be um, content in many cases to hear directly from them, which is a, a bit unusual for, for, um, for the courts. So if we move on to the next slide, um, this is just a, this is just a summary of, of what we've covered. So um, I won't go through that again, but um, I would say if, if um, anyone has any discrete queries or particular cases where they're not sure about capacity or best interest, I'm really happy to discuss them and give some pointers. Um, but I would say that if um, you have queries, the Mental Capacity Act Code of Practice is a very good place uh, to start. Um, it's easy to find online and in some ways it's more detailed and certainly easier to read than the Mental Capacity Act. So um, I would start there. But that's it from me, so I'll pass back to Gertrude. Thank you, Thank Hugh. That was brilliant. brilliant. Um, so our next speaker is Sarah Whelans, who is an associate solicitor in the Cambridge Medical Negligence Team. Um, Sarah's practice increasingly involves dealing with complex medical negligence claims, and she has a specialist interest in brain injury cases causing life altering injuries. In addition, Sarah also works with nurses, clinicians and hospital units across East Anglia to deliver training to increase patient safety and awareness of the impact errors in care can have. She has a very good working relationship with those she develops training opportunities with who recognise the benefits of a collaborative approach to improving patient safety. We'll hand over to Sarah now. Thanks, Gerps. Um, thank you for that introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been asked to um, provide a case study um, just really showing um, where capacity issues arise following a preventable neurological injury um, and the injury that, and the issues that this can have on a patient. Um, so I want to talk about um, my client, um, Christian. Um, he was a 39 year old male um, who had a history of alcohol abuse and depression. Um, just to put that into a bit more context, he would um, have alcohol binges which would last um, a few days and then would uh, completely abstain for a few months. Um, and it was really the depression that would cause these spirals. Um, anyway, back in um, 2017, he was transferred um, to A&E via ambulance, having suffered a seizure at home. Um, his medical um, history included um, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which he suffered in 2010, um, but that was successfully treated by clipping at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. Um, residual injuries following treatment of the subarachnoid hemorrhage were minimal um, and he was fully um, independent. Um, he um, had earnings capacity um, due to his alcohol issues. There were gaps in employment, but he was um, employable. Um, he had um, a great support network in terms of friends and family. He could drive. Um, he liked to socialise, play sports and so on. Um, so anyway, upon, upon admission to hospital, um, initial investigations revealed extreme um, hyponatremia and as such he was transferred to critical care for treatment, um, which was considered to be the best place for him um, in light of um, the risk of suffering further seizures. seizures. Um, and the treatment plan would include a slow correction of his sodium levels. Unfortunately, during the admission to critical care, um, there was an over rapid correction of his sodium levels um, and there was a failure by staff treating him to have sufficient regard to the risk of overcorrection of serum sodium and therefore the well recognised complication of central and extrapontine myelinysis um, arose. Um, he then ha subsequently had an MRI scan which confirmed the diagnosis. Um, he developed progressive neurological symptoms in keeping with central pontine um, myelinolysis, um, which resulted in permanent disability. Um, the injury um, is lifelong um, and permanent and affects his cognition, uh, mobility and coordination, both in terms of his upper and lower limb function. His speech is affected, as is his ability to swallow. Um, um, during the course of the litigation, the claimant has been assessed as lacking capacity uh, to conduct the litigation and manage a large award of damages. Um, he's also dependent on others for assistance with daily living activities and his personal care. Um, his current position is that he has no um, employment capacity. Um, he also requires um, care from professional carers. Um, he's hugely dependent on his family to provide this um, at present. 
uh, but we are looking at getting a package in place so that that can be provided professionally. Um, he requires aids and appliances in the form of wheelchairs, um, IT equipment and devices to assist with personal care and development. Um, he requires assistance with travel, whether that be to rehabilitation, medical appointments and so on. Um, he requires adapted um, accommodation. Um, he currently lives in an ex-council property um, that he bought with his mother. Um, it's wholly unsuitable um, for his needs um, and he his bedroom's upstairs um, and there's a very steep set of stairs um, which is quite unsafe um, at the moment. He'll also need um, occupational therapy and regular neurological and medical examinations. Um, he needs case management assistance and assistance in the management of any award of damages. Um, and due to the um, lack of capacity, he will require a professional deputy to assist in the management of his award of damages. This was something that he's, he struggled with. Um, you can sit down and have a conversation with Christian you can talk about his day, you can ask him how he's feeling, you can talk about his interests and um, have um, a reasonable, reasonable conversation with him. He's a really likeable guy. Um, for him, it, he really struggled with the lack of control of his physical limitations and then um, also the additional requirement for a professional deputy um, to um, take some control of his um, damages. Um, he's also really suffered with um, the limitations um, of COVID. Um, before the pandemic, he was um, going to a rehabilitation farm where, you know, he had social interaction with others. Um, he was working there, which was assisting his rehabilitation and he'd regularly go to the gym and he was very determined to get back to um, an, an, as normal way of life as possible. Um, and used to undertake all of these um, to, to really facilitate that. Um, unfortunately, COVID and him being so vulnerable has had a devastating effect on this. Um, you know, he can't get out and, and rehabilitate. He's struggling to socialise. He lives in quite a small house, so it's dramatically affected his quality of life and he's so much more dependent upon um, his family to provide um, support. Um, just to put it into context, Christian is the youngest of um, 11 siblings, so he is he comes from a really huge family. Um, he's a seven foot tall guy who is now reliant upon his sisters for almost anything. Um, and it's been that's been really hard for him to get used to. Um, so initially, when he was discharged from hospital after the incident took place, um, he went to a rehabilitation facility. Um, however, he absolutely hated it. Um, within a couple of weeks, he was deemed to have capacity to make medical decisions and he self-discharged against advice. Um, his family, um, you know, um, accepted his decision, um, not knowing that they couldn't really do anything about it, but they wanted to make it clear to him that things were going to be different um, and he wouldn't be able to go back to his previous way of living. Um, the story all, always um, stays with me that his sister got Christian home he was adamant that he wanted to go upstairs to his room. Um, of course, he had a very steep set of stairs to tackle, um, which wasn't particularly safe. And he was um, only a few weeks post injury. Um, Christian soon realised whilst trying to crawl up the stairs that things were going to be a lot tougher than he thought. Um, however, since then, um, he has shown real determination to work as hard as possible to regain as much of his abilities as possible. Um, however, it's very clear that he faces a daily struggle with every task that you and I um, take for granted. He's also had to come to terms with um, a lot of independence. Um, sad, very sadly, his mum passed away in January um, 2020 and um, he lived with his mum and she provided a lot of care to him. Um, but actually he managed to, he's coped really, really well with that. And I think it's um, it's unbelievable um, how determined he is, despite you know the rehabilitation, despite a change in family circumstances that he's really, really um, pushed to um, rehabilitate as much as possible. Um, so he obviously um, needs, sorry, he um, is very dependent upon his family and um, his sisters have now stepped in and taken over 
um, a lot of the care um, that he requires. Um, however, you know, he's really struggled with that and what has um, come um, to fruition with that, and I think Dr Ford commented on this um, earlier, is it does affect the whole family and his sister commented to me that, you know, they don't have that brother-sister relationship anymore, she's his carer, um, and I think that's a loss that they both now have to suffer um, and almost a grief that they have to deal with. Um, he has continuous frustration at his limitation and his reliance upon others. Um, he was initially um, receiving care in the community, but he really um, struggled with it. Um, he has got to the stage now where he just wears clothes that are really easy to get on. So he has to request the minimal, minimal amount of support as possible. Um, he, you know, he, he eats meals that are not particularly healthy because they're just really easy to prepare um, and the safest things to do. And so he's really adapted how he lives to try and be as independent as possible. But um, despite this, you can see how difficult he finds things um, and how frustrating this is for him. Um, he also suffers a reluctance to relinquish control um, despite having no option um, since being deemed to lack capacity to manage his affairs. Um, he suffers daily fatigue and exhaustion on performing the most simple of tasks. Um, as Kushin um, mentioned earlier, you know, he suffers pain um, on a daily basis. He suffers sleep difficulties, um, you know, quite often laying awake for half the night. Um, um, one thing is obviously a complete loss of control, not only physically, um, but in terms of his um, independence, his um, financial independence. Um, he has severe cognitive and, me and memory issues impacting his ability to cope with taking medication, attending appointments, you know, dealing with, admi with, with admin. Um, he's really heavily reliant on memory aids um, for simple things like taking medication, um, using alarms on his phone to try and trigger recollections, um, to remind him to do things. Um, you know, his sisters are having to regularly tell him the order in which he needs to get dressed and get ready so he can be ready for appointments on time. Um, he suffers speech issues. Um, his speech has been significantly affected um, and he does struggle to get his words out, um, especially when he gets tired um, or when he's not feeling um, very comfortable. Um, he has problems with swallowing, um, requiring the use of aids such as straws. Um, he suffers balance coordination um, issues um, affecting his limbs, which means it's difficult for him to negotiate his home and outside, which means that it's not particularly safe um, and he can easily fall. Um, and because of all of this, he really has suffered a huge loss of confidence. Um, he commented to me that he hates going out for meals because he can't cut his own food and he's embarrassed by this. Um, and if he's with someone who he doesn't feel comfortable with, he'll just order something he doesn't have to cut up. Um, and then, of course, there's this overwhelming guilt that he's burdening his loved ones with his care needs. And these are things that Christian has to deal with on a daily basis. Um, as I said, you know, Christian's had a tough few years since suffering the injury. Um, not only has he had to deal with a really tough rehabilitation, he's also had to deal with the death of his mother um, last year. Um, and despite this, um, he has really controlled his drinking um, and significantly reduced his drinking and even the death of his, of his mum and his daily battles have not precipitated a binge like he used to experience in the past. Um, he does tend to downplay his disability and he likes to give the impression that he's a lot more able than he in fact is. Um, he's worked tirelessly at his rehabilitation to gain, regain as much ability and control as possible. Thankfully, um, and it makes life a lot easier for us. Liability for, the, for his injuries has been admitted by the Defendant Trust and we are currently focusing on um, quantifying the claim with the input from um, neuro rehabilitation specialist, neuropsychology specialist, um, neuropsychiatry, care and occupational health, sorry occupational therapy, um, physiotherapy, speech and language therapy, accommodation experts and assistive technology experts. So as you can see, you know, a huge range of specialists required um, to try and um, determine exactly what Christian's needs are um, for the rest of his life. Um, and ultimately, we really hope to be in a position to assist um, Christian, to assist the experts, to put Christian into a position whereby he has sufficient resources to live as independently and fulfilled his life as possible, 
um, despite his limitations. Um, and hopefully Christian and his sister can resume their previous brother-sister relationship. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing that. Um, and it really puts into context everything that Dr. Ford and Hugh have been talking about today. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, and I think the first one really is for Dr. Ford. Um, how would you determine who is best placed um, and the type of specialist to make capacity decisions when someone has suffered a stroke? Um, it, it depends very much on the, um, the disabilities and how severe they are. So if it was like a case of someone who's got a really significant alcohol problem, um, strong in behavioural emotional issues, then I'd say a neuro a psychiatrist. Uh, if it's somebody who's got like epilepsy or they've got seizures, absences, strong migraines, then I I then say let's get a neurologist. Um, the, if it's cognitive, memory, concentration, you know, the executive, the neuropsych, speech and language, if it's got severe like communication issues, then speech and language. So it's how is the patient individual presenting, what are the significant issues and prioritise them and that should be an indicator. Yeah. OK, um, and just following on from that, and I think um, a, lot, a lot of the lawyers on the line uh, listening today would um, have this issue. How likely is it that different specialists would reach differing conclusions and how do you best deal with that? Uh, um, is that for me? Yeah. Yes, for you. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm often at loggerheads with the neuropsychiatrists and what we tend to do is um, if the if the if the individual is severely psychologically impaired that receive, requires significant medication, then I would all, I was always offer an opinion, but I would defer to a neuropsychiatrist to confirm it for the support of that. Um, and if it's a neuropsychiatrist that knows the role of a neuropsychologist, what they should normally do is say, look, I can comment on the emotional mood issues, but when it comes to cognitive factors, is, I will defer to the neuropsychologist. But there have been cases where I've, I've come across um, certain professionals, such as neurologists, that will just say, no, there's nothing wrong with this person. Cognitive is all psychological. And then I'll have to say, well, I'm really sorry. I think you should either defer to me or to a neuropsychiatrist. So sometimes there's a clash. It depends on the expert and how much they're prepared to acknowledge what's their expertise and what they how much they're prepared to defer to us. I usually just have this image of well imagine you're in the witness box and you're cross-examined would you feel comfortable with that opinion and that that usually makes them sort of go back and think well okay I'll, I'll just stick to my area so it does vary depending on who you're dealing with. Um, brilliant thank you and here I, I suppose just come to you does it ever cause as, as a solicitor acting for um, clients does that would that ever cause you an issue where different specialisms um, have differing opinions? Yeah so it's a really interesting question I mean I think obviously so we're not delegating the decision to that expert from our point of view so we're instructing that expert to provide evidence for us or the court so that we can make an informed decision about whether they have capacity. Um, if that were to arise and I suppose if, if it comes back and often someone's borderline say and we you know we think there's a there's a real vulnerability there and the, the, the expert has confidently said it might be a psychiatrist um, has confidently said that they have capacity we might ask them to go back and, and and think about it again in very limited circumstances because a lot of the work we're doing is on legal aid we will get a second opinion but the other option of course is just to just to have them cross cross examined and the parties can make submissions on it but I would rarely come across a scenario where you've got two different experts saying different things purely because of the way that our cases operate. Um, but I certainly would seek a second opinion or um, ask them to go back to the drawing board if I felt that their conclusions weren't applying the act, because in reality, they shouldn't really be reaching different conclusions if they're applying the act properly. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, I'm going to hand back to Jenna to wrap up the session now. Thanks, Gertz. I just wanted to say a huge thank you to our guest speakers for sharing your knowledge and experience about capacity issues that stroke survivors face. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone behind the scenes for putting this series together and thanking everyone that has joined us this afternoon. We hope that you found the session useful and if you've got any further questions, please do not hesitate to get in contact with us.
as I said at the start of the webinar today, a recording will be circulated. Um, and if you missed the last session, the recording for that will also be available for you. Um, we still have one final webinar in our Let's Talk About Stroke mini series, and we really hope that you can join us for that too. And that's taking place next Thursday at two o'clock. Please also feel free to go to erwinmitchell.com for all legal updates and information regarding future webinars. And if you can spare two minutes today to provide us with your feedback on the session, it would be most appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon.